final interactive class and the final class we'll be making in this selection of videos is going to be our interactive spring. We already actually have a lot of what we need going here. In fact, we have everything we need going. So what I'm going to do, rather than creating a brand new class, remember that this one, our health class here, is already inheriting from the interactive base, which is exactly what we need. So what I'm going to do instead, rather than completely recreating the will, I'm going to control W, our interactive health, name this one interactive spring, and inside of here again we can see that this will take the same default values as the health, so we're deriving from the parent class of the interactive base, which is the main thing here. Uh, we have a variable, so this float variable is going to be very useful in a moment, I could already kind of envision what we're going to be using, and we have our interact function also being called. So the, the main things that we're going to need are just here. We can rework this a little bit, we won't want to destroy the spring whenever it's used. We won't want to add health, but we will need two variables, which are going to be the player reference. We want to do something to that. And this health value, we're just going to need to change the name, but we already have it available. All we really want to do when the spring is touched, we're going to come in here and we're going to call the launch character function. So again, this is where it's useful to know that we're interacting directly with the BP underscore player base because we know it's a type of character uh, that also lets us know we can use this default built-in functionality in the character class to launch and essentially just adding velocity to our character class is kind of like a jump but with some different overrides. The reason that we want our float value, we just move this down, we don't want to take in any x or y velocity so we'll split the structure pin here and we basically we can plug this into the z as the amount launch the character on the z-axis. We want to override the z-override, so we'll tick this to be true, and we can rename this to our launch force. And like we've seen in the past, we can leave this public, so again, on any of the different springs that we have around the level, we can very easily update and override how much force is going to be applied. I think by default, 20 or 10, even, even lower, is going to be quite low, so we can start with something around about 500. I have a good feeling for an impulse of 500. It may be too low, we can update that in the level when testing. Now the next thing is to remember the way that the visuals are going to work. So the visuals first of all, we want to change the paper flipbook. We're going to change this from the heart to be our spring. And if we just hop over to the viewport here, we can also see that our collider is going to be a little bit small. I think really all I want to change is the width of this though. So we're going to go to the interactive collider change the width which is going to be our x to just about fit this and then remember that we have a scene anchor here so that allows us the freedom and flexibility to change the position of the flip book or in this case the interactive collider because the interactive collider is a child of the flip book of course if we move that the collider will move with it so what we want to do is take this collider and just move this down roughly to the bottom of the uh, the spring but the idea is if this wasn't playing it will be sat just above the top of the spring so that it will look like as soon as we hit the top of that spring we're going to play this animation. So that's the visual side done there and updated. The final thing is back in the interact function remember that we're going to set this to auto play to be false so we're not going to be playing constantly in the level. What we will want to do is as soon as we've interacted with this we're going to set this to play from the start. We do that by getting our paper flipbook so control dragging in the paper flipbook and then finding the play from start function. We'll just hook that back up and tidy the function a little bit and that is pretty much all that the interactive spring really needs to do. So again if we come back into the level here we probably have too many springs so I'm going to grab one of these with the interactive spring selected. We can right click on the heart and we can choose the replace selected actor with and one of the options is going to be the interactive spring because we have it selected here. So we'll replace it with that. We can see this will automatically change and we can come in here and move this around. Now in the editor, looking at it, maybe this will be a little bit annoying that we have these animating constantly. So back in the interactive base, what I'm gonna do is grab this and just pop this into the construction script. So this should hopefully stop any looping animation. And there we go. We can see that the, uh, the spring has immediately stopped animating. So that lets us know that this is working. Is only going to change if we move the location. But that's better than having it springing constantly. And let's add a couple of these in as well. So we can use one over here. When we get past this section, we can allow the player to easily jump up and reach this section. These are also going to work as good ways to kind of test different velocities and the impulse that we're going to be adding. So perfect. We can see that that didn't animate before we started playing. 
jump on this, it's going to animate once. Not going to go back to looping, we need to kill the bat. And we can jump on this again. I think the impulse is maybe a little bit too low, so it doesn't look as though we're being pushed up quite as high as we need. So we can come in, we can change this to maybe 800, and then hopefully... Yeah, so that looks as though it's actually we're going up with the spring rather than through it, and that's pushing us up a nice distance. So we can go and play with different values on the other one, so we could test maybe what this would feel like with an impulse of a thousand. And they're both pretty good, but the main thing you can see is that these are resetting the animation. The hearts are playing constantly, and everything is pretty much responding as we would hope and expect. Hopefully with that you've seen the, the kind of values of adding these public properties as well, so we can easily come in and change the health values now, the spring values, so we can add some extra launch force. And like I've said, if we really wanted, we could set one of the springs for whatever reason to automatically play, and one of the hearts to not play. So when we come in and play now, this one's going to keep pulsing for no real good reason, and the heart is going to be frozen in place. So we have a little bit of flexibility with how our classes are working. All derived from the same kind of base class, meaning that we needed to program a lot of this only once, and we can reuse it between different inherited child classes. Now the only other thing that I haven't really touched on is that we're getting a lot of different items coming in over here. So you may want to start renaming some of these, especially consider the way that we changed one of the hearts to be a spring component or a spring actor. It's still named the default name. So we can see it is a spring actor here, but it's still called BP underscore interactive health. So anything can be renamed here. We can change this to spring and that will kind of update correctly. And we've got the same thing for this one because that was just a copy of the original one, which was already called health. And now another thing you might want to start doing is you can create different groups. So you can add subfolders here. So we'll name one enemies and we'll create another one and we'll name this one interactives. Main reason being is that we can then easily drop enemies into enemies, interactives into interactives. And if we ever wanted to clear things up and just look at the level, do a little bit more level design, we can hide certain things. Of course, when you press play, all of these are going to come back. This is only editor related. And of course, it just means as well, you're not going to have this huge hundreds and hundreds of items drop down at all times, especially if you just wanted to find something like the light source, move something around, then it's going to make things a little bit easier to navigate through. And we can drop these down and work with them whenever needed. With all of that done, we now have the basics of a 2D platformer set up and working inside of the Unreal Engine. Hopefully throughout the series of videos, you've come to appreciate some of the power that can be leveraged from Unreal. And although there are some slight hindrances with the flipbook system, the way that we can automate some of the processes of working with those, and it really isn't that bad. We've still got this really, really useful pile editing tool fully compatible with collisions and things that I've not even dived into. Like we could set up materials using the default Unreal Material Editor to take into things like normal so we can add lighting and essentially replicating 3D lighting techniques on these 2D sprites if we had that information available. There's much, much more that you could do with this, but again, this is really just to bring to light a little bit more that this is definitely more than a suitable 2D engine as well as 3D. All we're really doing at the end of the day is taking away an axis or two. Um, and again, Unreal has all of these things where we can constrain different things to different axes to allow us to really easily work in a 2D world. So if you've enjoyed this content, do be sure to follow me for more content like this. We'll be looking at making bigger, more in-depth updates to similar content in the future. So do be sure to follow me on here for content like that, if this was something you found useful and wanted to see more of. So I hope you've enjoyed the series of videos. If you've gotten this far, then thank you for following along with everything and going through the entire process with me. So thank you for your time and patience, and I look forward to seeing you in the future.